So we've got the shofar, but then we've got the silver horns, right? And the silver horns, there were two of them, right? And one blast was to gather the leaders together, and two blasts was to gather the congregation together, which was all the people, right? So hopefully all the people were listening, <laughs> but it doesn't look like it. <laughs> anyway, um, today we're going to talk uh, and speak from Devarim. What's Devarim? Yeah, Deuteronomy. Chapter 12, verse 20 through, verse, through chapter 13, verse 1. It was a very short section this week. So maybe that means the rabbi won't talk as long. What do you think? You think that's possible? No, I don't know. We'll see. So we'll start with uh, my wife coming forward, if she's willing, because some people liked that. I don't know. So see what happens. I'm not sure how much she likes it or not, though. If there are other volunteers who are good readers, you can... Yeah, yeah, grab another microphone. If anyone else wants to volunteer, if you feel like you're a really good reader. Is she a really good reader? Yeah. Okay, so we're starting with verse 20, yeah, 1220. When Adonai your God expands your territory as he has promised you, and you say, I want to eat meat simply because you want to eat meat, then you may eat meat as much as you want. Did the point come across there pretty easily? <laughs> eat meat, eat meat, eat meat, right? Um, so the deluge has come. You know what I mean when I say a deluge? The major, major cataclysmic flood has already hit the earth. Right? So the original diet, which is in uh, Bereshit or Genesis 129, has been extended. We're no longer in Gan Eden, in the Garden of Eden. Uh, flood has destroyed the earth. And so now we're allowed to eat meat. Uh, some say Baruch Hashem. And uh, if you like meat. Um, and so we see that you can eat meat in, in Bereshit 9, uh, verse 3. And uh, then the Torah defines which meats we can eat, of course, right? So uh, as I'm thinking about this verse, 1 Timothy 4.3 uh, came to mind for some reason. Maybe I was reading another commentary or uh, I don't know. Uh, but 1 Timothy 4.3, there's this group who are talked about. There's some group who Shaul was talking to Timothy about, a group of people who were, who were doing two things. They were forbidding to marry, and they were also abstaining from foods. Everyone say, forbidding f to marry and abstaining from foods. And not just any foods, foods which God hath created to be received. Okay, so I would suggest that we take that second comma out and that it's forbidding to marry is one thing and forbidding and uh, abstaining from foods which God has created to be received, right? Um, it's not from abstaining, abstaining from foods, anything, anyone, anywhere, ever thinks as, of as food, which are all created by God to be received. No, that second comma. Remember, there were no commas in the Torah originally, right? And no commas in the Greek passages either originally. And so abstaining from foods that God created to be received. That it, and, and where are foods defined, by the way? In the Torah, in Leviticus 11, and there's one other spot as well. Okay, so... Um, is that verse in Timothy talking about Jews and kashrut? Because a lot of Christians, if you've been in the Messianic movement for a while, you probably had that verse thrown at you at some point, right? Um, this is you guys. What are you doing? You're not supposed to be, what are you doing? Abstaining from foods. This is a very bad group, very bad group if you read the passage, right? So um, how many of you know any Messianic congregations, this one included, where we're forbidding you to marry? Raise your hand. I didn't think so. So is this talking about us? 
No, very clearly, no. Okay, uh, so we have to know what food is when we do look at this passage, right? It doesn't, it's not uh, abstain from eating anything, it's abstaining from foods. And who, def who defines what food is? God defines, decides what food is. We might decide to eat something else. When I was a little kid, uh, we used to eat all kinds of weird things. We used to eat Elmer's glue. And we used to, I don't know, we had all kinds of weird things we used to eat, right, when we were really little ones. Um, but that doesn't mean that Elmer's glue is food, does it? Right? So uh, we need to use a little wisdom. And God tells us what, it, uh, what is actually food. Uh, and the context, part of the context of this verse is, in, it says, in the acharit hayamim, as it's leading up to it. In the acharit hayamim. Who knows what this is? In the latter days, the end of days, at the end of the age, you could say, hayamim, the days. Acharit. Remember, some of you Hebrew students, leaf, remember those preposition chapters? Lifne achare. Lifne achare. Right? Before and after. So the latter days. The later days. And in those latter days, how many believe we're in the latter days, by the way? We bet, good. I hope all hands go up because Shaul said we're in the latter days, and that was 2,000 years ago. So we're in, the, we're in the latter, latter, latter days or something. We're well on into the latter days. Okay, and in those latter days, near the end of the age, deceiving spirits, it says, with doctrines of demons. The people who are forbidding to marry and telling you to abstain from foods right? Uh, this uh, together, both of these things together. These people are, they're getting this from deceiving spirits who, and it's, these are doctrines of demons. Now I'm going to ask you a question to help you with this in case you're struggling. Who inspired the Torah? Adonai? Ruach. I think, yeah, Ruach HaKodesh. I'm not sure which one you said over there. <laughs> Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, inspired the Torah, yes? If you're not sure, read 2 Timothy 3, uh, 3, 16 and 17, right? Um, where all Scripture is God-breathed and what was considered Scripture at the time, the Tanakh, right? So who inspired the Scriptures in the Torah where food is defined? The Ruach HaKodesh did. Is the Ruach HaKodesh a deceiving spirit? It is, are the things that the Ruach HaKodesh says in the Torah, are those doctrines of demons? No. no, there's something else that's being talked about there. Are we all clear on that? Is that is that is there anything hazy there at all as far as that goes? Okay, good. So who is this passage about? And if you read different commentators, including most uh, uh, of the more scholarly Christian uh, commentators as well as Messianic commentators, you will find that the groups in question are usually Gnostics. Gnostics are those who say they have secret knowledge. Secret knowledge. There's a lot of them out today, actually. And ascetics. Ascetics are people who see anything in the physical world as evil. Only the spiritual things are good. Anything physical is evil, right? And so people at Qumran were somewhat ascetic, the Qumran uh, community. Um, so they did an awful lot of fasting. People, uh, what's his name? St. Francis, <laughs> right? Not big on Catholics, but St. Francis uh, was pretty cool. He was very extreme. He, uh, when he died, he didn't think anything physical. He didn't think we should, we should own anything. If you follow Yeshua, that's how extreme he was. When he died, he didn't even own the loincloth he was wearing, which is all he was wearing, uh, because that's how extreme he was that we should, you know, not own anything. But that's not uh, what God says. Anyway, uh, so the Gnostics and the ascetics who see the world and all physical things as evil are the ones who most scholars say this verse is talking about. Boom. If the place which Adonai your God chooses to place his name is too far away from you, then you are to slaughter animals from your cattle or sheep, which Adonai has given you, and eat on your own property as much as you want. Eat it as you would gazelle or deer, 
the unclean and clean alike may eat it. All right. Are these offerings? Right, not offering. Well, they could be. Uh, no, they're not offerings. Sorry. And uh, is this any meat? This is quiz in case you weren't listening on the first page. Then here's your quiz. It's not any meat, right? Where is food defined again? Yeah, I put it down there for you if you don't know. Vaikra, what's, what is Vaikra? Leviticus or Vaikra. Uh, it actually goes the other way, right? What is Leviticus? Vaikra. <laughs> and what is Deuteronomy? Devarim. So Vaikra 11 and Devarim 14. If you don't know what uh, food actually is, that's where you want to look. And, you know, also in this verse it said, if the place which Adonai your God chooses to place his name, Right? This is referring to, uh, before we ever got to the land, there was going to be a place where all the sacrifices needed to be made. It was a place where Adonai would choose his name to dwell. It wasn't for us to select it. He was going to choose a place for his name to dwell. How many of you have taken Hebrew, at least Hebrew 1, and you've heard me talk about the sheen and how it represents God's name? And you even saw, me, uh, you even saw the picture that I show, right? This one with a big sheen, like stamped into the earth, with the uh, different mountains. You see the Mount of Olives up on the top. You see the Kidron Valley. Some of you have seen this in person now. Uh, and it comes down to this point at the bottom of the City of David. You see the Central Valley. The City of David is between those two. You see the Temple Mount up on top, like it's the big dot on top of the sheen. Uh, and then Mount Zion and Yafagate is this larger part of the old city. And uh, some of the valley... Uh, the Hinnom Valley on the far side, they all come down and they meet down here in the corner. See how deep the Hinnom Valley is? Yeah, see how dark it looks? It's showing you how that's very deep, right? The Dung Gate was on the side over here. They would go down through the city of David to the bottom, and so all the refuse would be, this is like the garbage dump, the Hinnom Valley, but it's also where uh, during uh, King Shlomo's time, that altars were built to false gods, and even children were burned alive in, uh, in some of them to Molech, a false god. But in any case, what you see here when you look at these three valleys together, boom, you see like a big stamped sheen right on top of this place. This is the place where he caused his name to dwell. There are other scriptures that tell us this is where he chose for his name to dwell, and that's where the temple was built. Okay. Just take care not to eat the blood, for the blood is the life, and you are not to eat the life with the meat. Don't eat it, but pour it out on the ground like water. Okay. You see where it says take care in your Bibles? I don't know. Some of you aren't even looking at the Bibles, but see where it says take care? Uh, in the Hebrew, it says rach chazak. How many of you are familiar with rach chazak? I know some in the other room are. This is, at one point, uh, it was considered a battle cry in the book of Yehoshua. Who's Yehoshua? Joshua, right? Yeah. Be strong and courageous, right? And when we're going into battle, because this was Adonai was talking to him, telling him over and over and over again, be strong, be courageous, be, you know, be a man, you could say. Stand up, be a man, you know, don't be afraid. And then when the people were going into the battle, into battle, the soldiers going into battle, the same thing was the battle cry, telling them, Rachazak, be strong. And here, that's what's in this verse. It doesn't say just take care. It says just Rachazak, be strong not to eat the blood. You know, sometimes it takes strength, inner strength, to, to defy peer pressure, for example, of those around you who are doing things that are wrong. You've got to be strong to stand up to things like that. When you're enveloped, when you're engrossed, when you're submerged in a society that's filled with filth and sin everywhere you turn, you've got to rachazak, you've got to be strong. Amen? A couple of you. Oh, man. Rachazak, everyone, look at your neighbor and encourage them. Say, Rachazak. Be strong. Be strong. 
don't eat blood. In the Torah, it was even before Moshe, we were told not to eat blood. And after the flood, we were still told, you know, after the flood, we were told not to eat blood. In the Torah of Moshe, we were told not to eat flood. As early as uh, Bereshit 9.4, when we were first told that we could eat meat, we were told not to eat blood. At the last Seder, some guy named Yeshua <laughs> said, this is my blood, which ratifies the Brit Chadashah. Do you think he was telling them to commit cannibalism, to defy the Torah, the law of God, do you think the Messiah, the real Messiah, not a false Messiah, would be telling the people, break God's law now and drink my blood, my actual blood? I hope it's an easy answer. But for Christianity, for many hundreds of years, it hasn't been an easy answer. If, uh, if somebody comes and they say that they're Messiah and they're telling you to break God's commandments, guess what they are? A false Messiah. A false Messiah. He's saying, this is my blood which ratifies the Brit Chadashah. He's holding what? The cup of redemption, which is full of, the, of wine, which is called, what else is wine known as? The blood of grapes. This is symbolic. It's called figurative language. And otherwise, in Acts 15, 20, and in verse 29, and in chapter 21, verse 25, when the people out in the, in the diaspora, Goy, Jews and Goyim, and this particular question is from the Goyim, send to Jerusalem and say, hey, what about these Gentiles? Are they what are they supposed to do? Aren't they supposed to yada, yada, yada? And there's a ruling council, and there are certain things they say. Here's a starting point. Don't worry about it. you. You are accepted in the community, and you are supposed to go to the, to the shul and the synagogue every week, because part of it says these are the basic rules. These are the foundational rules. This is what you should do. Because you will hear the Torah every week in the synagogue, right? Meaning, you know, which implies they believe these new believers will be going where? To the synagogue. When? On Sunday? On Shabbat, it says. It's very clear in the language in Acts that their ex expectation is these people would grow from this point. But initially, there's just a few things listed. One of them is don't drink blood. Apparently, it was a very important thing because blood, drinking blood is v disgusting. Vampires drink blood. Ooh, yuck. Don't, so don't drink blood. And so this was a, a ruling going out to the Goyim from the leaders who actually walked on this earth with Yeshua. Are you with me? So we're not actually drinking actual real blood. It's called a figure of speech. It's a metaphor. A metaphor is a thing symbolic of another thing. When Yeshua says, I'm a rock... Is he a literal rock? No. no, rocks don't walk, and they don't, right? They don't wear things unless, you know, ay, ay, ay. It's things that shouldn't have to say, right? It's a metaphor, right? The blood of grapes is representing his actual blood that he's about to die and pour out for them, right? When he says, I, I will, is, what is basically saying, which I cover often here among you, is I'm willing to give my life for you. It's like that marriage proposal, giving that cup to the woman, offering the cup to the woman full of the blood of grapes. And the man is saying, the young man, and to, to the young lady, I'm willing to give my life for you. Will you have me? I would, I would give my life blood for you. Which is very different than the, than the basis and foundation for many marriages today. Where people are going into marriage with the idea, what can I get from this person? It should be, what can I, I want to take care of this person. I love this person, not I want to take advantage of this person. The Romans charged people because a lot of people in the diaspora, a lot of the Goyim, didn't understand this. And so they started saying, we're eating his body and drinking his blood. And the Roman government charged believers with, guess what? Cannibalism. Cannibalism. The, uh, and by the way, part of this, even to this very day, the Roman, notice Romans, and the uh, ecclesia or the kahal, the kahila, uh, when it takes on this new institutional name later on, uh, right? In this later institutional organization, uh, they have priests. There's a difference between a rabbi and a priest. A rabbi is a teacher. I teach you things, right? 
Um, a priest is something different. A priest is a medi- uh, intermediary. They make s- a priest makes sacrifices for you. When they take the, the bread and the blood and they break that bread, they are in their understanding, in their own theology, they are saying that they are crucifying him, they are sacrificing him over again every time they do that. What does the Bible say? My Bible says he was, he was sacrificed once for all. But they believe they're doing it over and 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 over every week, every place. It's a doctrine called transubstantiation, where they believe after they say these, you might as well call them magic words, after they say this, this certain, these certain words over, over the wafer and the grape juice or wine, I think they use wine, Catholics use wine. Anglicans don't, and they do some of the very same things. When they say this over it, it actually becomes his body and his blood. No wonder there's a charge of cannibalism. People who are believing that, and then they're sharing that and saying that openly. In their mind, it is cannibalism, even though it's not actually cannibalism. By the way, those words that were said are hoc est corpus meum. Now, churches were built in a way that's Latin, and, in, and, what they're say, and, and when they say it, the way churches were built, it would echo. This is my body, right? And it would echo throughout the place until the words kind of mingled together. If you're sitting very close, you could hear the priest say these things. You would know what he's saying. But people in the back, by the time the, the last few words are coming through, it would all kind of jumble together, and it would sound like, hocus pocus. <laughs> this is where hocus pocus comes from. No kidding. No kidding. And it kind of is like hocus pocus, isn't it? I'm saying magic words, and now it's actually Yeshua's blood and body. How big was Yeshua? There are Christian commentators who have said that if if transubstantiation is actually true, Yeshua had to be bigger than Mount Everest. Think of all the millions and millions of people, probably billions, over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, eating his body and drinking his blood for, all, for every week, all of this time. They say he had to be bigger than Mount Everest. Because they couldn't understand a metaphor. They could understand metaphors in other places, but somehow couldn't understand that it was a metaphor here. I don't know. But I think you know now, so that's good, and we can just move on, right? Do not eat it so that things will go well with you and your children after you as you do what Adonai sees as right. Yes, there's a purpose, right? There's a purpose here, a purpose clause. How do we know where the purpose is? Where's, where's the purpose clause start? What are the two key words to tell us what the, what the purpose clause is? So that. so that, yeah. That tells us the purpose. But it, it gives me pain sometimes. Like, do we, do we always need to know what the purpose is? If God tells you to do something, do you always have to... I don't know, you have kids, right? Do your kids always have to know? They think they always know why, why, why do I have to do this? Why can't I do that? But do they really need to know why? Or do they just need to do what you tell them to do? Is it the same way with God? I know you want to know why all the time, people of God. Why, why you can't do this? Why I should do that? But do you really need to know? Are you going to refuse to obey God unless you know why? Right? Maybe there are some commands that you that come to your mind when I say that, that you struggle with. Do you really need to know why? What is it? When you when you struggle like that, what is it? What's the root of that of that issue? It's a trust issue. 
God says do something. You have to trust it's in your best interest. Torah says it's what? For your own good. And those are the words of God through the person who's writing it because all scripture is God breathed, right? So it becomes a trust issue. Do I really believe that? Because if you believe that, then you'll do what God says. You don't have to always know. Nevertheless, look, it's the glory of man. More than that, it's the glory of kings, the scripture says, to search out a matter, to learn the why. But you don't have to wait until you know why to start doing it or stop doing whatever he tells you to stop doing, right? You Can't you search out the why as you're doing it and say, Wow, God is so wise. I just want to get some more insight into it and understand. Then you can search out the why. And that is the glory of kings. But do you know what the glory of God is? The glory of God is to conceal it. <laughs> to conceal a matter. In this verse, let me ask you, look at this verse. Is there a promise here in this verse for us? Can you all see it? What is the promise? Things will go well with you if you don't eat blood. It's very simple. Don't eat blood. Things will go well with you and with your children after you. If you what? Do what Adonai sees as right. From his perspective, it's right. He tells you what it, what it is. Do it, and things will go well with you. Is that a good promise? Do you want things to go well with you? Then what do you have to do? Trust. Another word for trust is believe. And, and the Hebrew for believe or trust is emunah. Emunah, that biblical faith slash trust that is evidenced in your life. It's not just mental assent. Amen? And what is the promise contingent upon again here? Obedience, yeah. In this case, don't eat blood. But obedience. Do what he says, and you'll be blessed. Only the things set aside for God which you have and the vows you have vowed to make, you must take and go to the place which Adonai will choose. There you will offer your burnt offerings and meet and the meat and the blood on the altar of Adonai your God. The blood of your sacrifices is to be poured out on the altar of Adonai your God, and you will eat the meat. Obey and pay attention to everything I am ordering you to do so that things will go well with you and with your descendants after you forever as you do what Adonai sees as good and right. Amen. So there are exceptions to this. Vows right? The things that would need to be uh, taken to the temple for vows or for guilt or sin or even voluntary offerings. If you look into uh, the commentaries, you'll find peace and thanksgiving offerings are eaten by the owner or guest. Not all offerings are eaten by the owner, the person who brings it, but certain ones are. And those are the peace and thanksgiving offerings. If you need a refresher on that, go ahead and you look on YouTube in the Back in the early chapters that we covered from Vaikra. What's Vaikra again? Leviticus. What are the key words here that bring blessings again in verse 28? Obey, obey, and pay attention to everything I'm ordering you to do. Obey and pay attention to everything I'm ordering you to do. Yeah, obedience, right? You got to pay attention. That sounds a lot. You know, all of that together, wrapped together, sounds like to me, you know, being in, in, in where we are, sounds to me like Shema. Shema. Just Shema. Just heed Adonai, and things will go well with you. And how long is forever? I want to say forever. You see that the key word, there was a, a word in here forever. Things will go well with you and your descendants after you forever as you do what Adonai sees, what his perspective, from his perspective, as good 
and right. That's you. <laughs> when Adonai, your God, has cut off ahead of you the nations you are entering in order to, to dispossess them, and when you have dispossessed them and are living in their land, be careful after they have been destroyed ahead of you not to be trapped into following them so that you inquire after their gods and ask, how did these nations serve their gods? I want to do the same. You must not do this to Adonai your God, for they have done to their gods all the abominations that Adonai hates. They even burn up their sons and daughters in the fire for their gods. First John 4.16 tells us that God is love, right? Is it a different God? See, because there's a heretic, Marcion said, see, this God, he hates things. It must not be the same God. He judges people and stuff like that. He must be a different God. There's the old evil God, and there's the new good loving God. Apparently, Marcion never read the book of Revelation, <laughs> right, where Yeshua is coming back to stomp on his enemies till their blood runs like, like, the blood of gra like the blood of grapes up to the bridles of the horse, right? God is love, yet he hates. What is it that he hates in this passage? Do you see it? Abominations. God hates abominations. There are certain things which are abominations. You can read about them in the Torah. Anybody know any of them off the top of your head? Idolatry from this passage. Fornication. Well, what was that? When I, I'm, I'm not saying this. What is it again? Homosexuality. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, God says that's an abomination, an abomination. So, and, and so that's what he hates in here. He hates abominations. Do, so key question here, does this warning still hold? Does God still hate abominations? Yeah, he never changes. He never changes. I don't care what Oprah says or Dr. Phil or anyone else. I care what the Bible says. Should someone tell the Pope about this? Are you watching the news? Should someone tell the Pope? I don't think he knows. The Pope who wears this meter that's very similar to the, to the cover that, uh, that uh, the priests of Dagon, uh, the fish god, would wear on their heads, they, they say that, the, you know, there's a defense on the Catholics' part. They'll say, no, this is a meter. This is not, this is not you know, the same thing. Uh, it's, it's taken from the Torah, they'll actually say. And this is what the priests and the Mishkan wore. Uh, no. Does that look like a turban to anyone here? The word in the Torah for what the priest wore was turban. Does that look like a turban? The fish head look like a turban to you, anybody? Sorry, Charlie, that's not a turban. Also, at the Vatican, you've heard me talk about it before. You can see a picture here. You can find close-ups if you look. You can just Google pictures and find the, that some of the, uh, w one of the things they did, they would took idols. This is the church, the Roman Catholic Church. They took idols of people like Zeus and other Greek gods brought them by ship to Rome into the Vatican and renamed them. One of the statues of Zeus is now Peter. Excuse me, Peter. It's an idol of Zeus. And people going to the Vatican for hundreds and hundreds of years would show their, their great devotion, which is really weird. To me, their great devotion to Peter by kissing Peter's toe. Even if it was Peter, I see this as really problematic, but it's not even Peter. It's a statue of Zeus. They've been kissing his toe until at this point, 
Peter's toe is gone. His big toe is worn off by the kisses of people who've been led astray to kiss the title, the toe of an idol of Zeus. What about necromancy? When you are, it's one thing to say, hey, we honor these people in the path, of, uh, in the past, like in the book of, of Hebrews in chapter 11, the heroes, some heroes of faith, right? That's one, if we look at them, they're exemplars. Look at what he did. I can't believe, you know, Abraham, so much faith. Look at Noah building the ship, so much faith, so wonderful. We should be you know, emulate their faith to the, whatever degree we can, right? Follow after them. It's a far cry from that to say we should pray to these people because they're now in heaven like they're little mini-gods or something and they can do miracles for you and that they can hear your prayers. Who is our God? Do we have more than one God? Who do we pray to? When you're praying to dead people, when you're talking, what is praying? It's communication. It's talking back and forth. You're talking to God when it's prayer, right? When you're, when you're praying, when you're talking to dead people, what are you doing? Necromancy. Guess what necromancy is from the last slide? It's an abomination. And how does God feel about abominations? He hates abominations. Should someone tell the Pope? I think he knows. Your turn. Everything I am commanding you, you are to take care to do. Do not add to it or subtract from it. You had me on that side, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> everything. Uh, look at your neighbor say, everything. 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 Ko the Hebrew here is kol hadavar. What is kol hadavar? I'm putting her on the spot here. Kol hadavar. Each, every, all hadavar. The matter, the thing, the word. Everything, every word, every matter. That's what. Every word, every thing, every matter that I'm commanding you. Who's the I? I don't know. That I'm commanding you, you are to what? Take care. What was take care again? Rach chazak. Be strong to do. And do not add to it and do not subtract from it. Amen? Take care. In this case, the take care is different from the other take care. See what it says here? And you might recognize the roots. Tishmaru. What do, you, do you see the root there? Anybody see the root? The sheen and the mem. And what's the third letter in the root? Resh. Like in Shomer, guard, protect, observe. And what's the, the root in the next word? La'asut. La'asut. No, Lamed is... I ain't seen... And the third one is dropped off. The hay, which is, you know, the, remember the root for doing what? Okay. Do. Do. Observe. Protect. See, be, this why the translation is like, be careful, take care. Uh, you will observe, protect, guard it to, in order to do it. Not just to know it, guard it, protect it. Protect it, observe it in order to do it. Amen? Has this verse been heeded? I've showed some of you some of these in the past. See this book? This is the BHS. Biblia Hebraica Studiat Gensia. It has the Masoretic text in there. And it's also got along the bottom notes on different pages. 
comparing different texts and showing you the difference in the different texts. Where in some texts things are added, in some texts things are omitted, from this text to that text, and in some place where things have been replaced. This is the NA28. This is the UBS. It's the same thing for the Brit Chadasha. For the thousands and thousands of manuscripts, Greek manuscripts of the Holy Scriptures, the same thing. But at the bottom, the section's even bigger usually. Things that have been removed, things that have been added, things that have been replaced, one thing for another, which is basically doing both. Take one thing out and add another. Are you surprised? I see sometimes there are people when you see a new English version comes out and scholars have come together and they, what, what we do, you, you can tell by the different texts, the different areas that they came from. You can examine, I, I've examined texts that will show you from the beginning, everything was exactly the same with this passage with four or five verses in a row, exactly the same for hundreds of years until about 300 and some, year 300 and something, like 11 or whatever, and all of a sudden, this is not scribal error, by the way, All of because it's not happening in one place. All of a sudden, all of them in every region, any new manuscripts all over the Roman Empire, all of them, all the family groups change at the same time. What is that? That, is, that particular one is Constantine. Some sort of counsel, some decision was made. We don't like the way that's written. That doesn't match our thinking. Does that disturb you? It should disturb you. I see some people now who get versions, newer versions of the Bible. Some of them are very, very bad, right? But some of them are very, very good. Some of them, the scholars get together, they say, this verse was nowhere. What, how, where did this verse come from? I don't see it anywhere in any of the regions, in any of the earliest manuscripts. The first time I see it is in 600 AD and only in Spain. How did it wind up in everybody's Bible today? I don't understand how this happens. It was in none of these manuscripts, of which we have many from before that. Where did it come from? In one case, a whole passage about this big. Where did it come from? Remember, there weren't printing, printing presses. Some of these things happen not because people are even planning them sometimes. Sometimes if someone hears a great message uh, and they are rich enough that they own their own copy of the scripture and they hear a great story that goes with the message, they might write the story into the side of it or something or underneath at the bottom of the page or something. And then the next time when someone is going to make a new copy of the scripture, they don't know if it was a note from the, origi from the original writing of, this, of the thing where maybe there was a mistake and the scribes were trying to fix it and correct it and saying, hey, that was missing. I had to add that in. They don't know that when they go to make a new copy years later from that manuscript. You see? <laughs> and things can wind up getting added in. So people, sometimes we, we know, because we can see older manuscripts that never was here, and all of a sudden it's here in this one place. I don't know why it's in the English Bibles right now. We, we, we're not going to put it in our version, because it's obviously it was not in the original. And then you see the internet theologian come on and say, those people are evil. Look what they did. They took out some of the word of God. Well... <laughs> Not in that case, they didn't. <laughs> Do you understand? People who don't know any better, they're just guessing. They're saying, it, it was in my Bible then. It's not in there now. These people must have taken it out. No. Your Bible that you had was printed in 2000-something, and it was from a version that originated in 1500-something or even later. You don't know what was in the original. 
which is a good reason, by the way, to start learning Hebrew and Greek so you can get books like that and you can see for yourself what the original said and not just guess about it. Does this make sense? For those who are still awake, it makes sense? Okay. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Yeah, don't get me started with some things that happen. Replacement, exactly. It's a dangerous game. Revelation talks about it with the prophecies that are written in Revelation. Those who, who take away from or add to the plagues of that book, what will happen to them? God will add all those plagues to them. Have people done this dangerous game, adding to the prophecies of Revelation? You ever hear of Nostradamus? <laughs> Is he adding to the plagues of Revelation? What about the Talmud? Adding to God's word. What about Jefferson's Bible? Did you, hear, you know about Jefferson's Bible where he take, took all the miracles out? Thomas Jefferson took all the miracles out. What do you think about that? Because he didn't believe in miracles. I, be I believe you sh he believed Yeshua, Jesus, was a great man. But I don't believe in this miracle stuff. We could take these lessons he teaches and use that for, for our kids. But we don't have what, this miracle stuff. What, what is that? Uh, they're not believing that he's God is what that is, what it boils down to. You understand? Our, let, me, let me ask you this question now. You have all of that in your head. Examine yourself. Are there parts of the Bible that you wish were not there? Are there parts that you struggle with or that you don't understand, and because of that, you wish they weren't there? Are there commandments or judgments of God with which you disagree? Search your heart. Who should conform? Who should conform? The Constantinian Council decided it's God who should conform. We're going to change his word. I'm asking you, who should conform? You or God? Do not conform to this present world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renewing of your mind, bringing you into conformity with God and his word. Amen? Folks, it's time. You told me you believe we're in the Acharit Hayamim. You told me you believe that we're in the last days. You can look at the news as it's unmistakable. It is unmistakable. There are prophecies that were supposed to happen in the, in the days. And guess what? A lot of them have already happened. We are there. It's time. It's time for the bride to do what? What is the bride supposed to do that Yeshua comes back for? Because he comes back for some, some people, right, are not ready. There are ten virgins and only half of them get in. There are people who think they're following Adonai. They call him Lord, Lord, but they don't mean it because they don't do what he says. And at the judgment, where are they going to be? It's time for the bride to make herself ready, to make herself wet, ready, to be wearing that pure white linen. And in all the commentaries, the Christian commentaries as well, those white garments represent good, guess what, bad word in some places, good deeds. And what defines what's a good deed? The word of God, the Torah. There are a lot of people who are in for a very rude awakening. God help them to find the truth before it's too late. I want to throw something at you too. There was something I brought in here the other week. We were talking about crosses. And, you know, the reason that we maybe, you know, as 
as beautiful as it looks maybe up here, and we were trying to maybe see what we can do to kind of cover it. And a lot of people don't really understand coming from a different background what, you know, what kind of reason there is. And mo the biggest thing, the biggest issue is that it's a stumbling block to any Jew who would even come into this place might not even come in here because they see it because of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of oppression, persecution, and tyranny against them and against their people by people who were carrying big crosses like this, the Inquisition, the Crusades. You know the Crusades, they, marked, they, they made it all the way to Jerusalem, retook Jerusalem, the very first crusade. They took, you know what they did? They took all the Jewish people, gathered them together in the main synagogue in Jerusalem, and they burned it down with the people inside while they marched around the outside singing songs like Onward Christian Soldier. Look, there, there are negatives, but I don't want to be all negative here. I know that at one point the, the T is also representative of the cult of Tammuz, false god. I know about the Ankh, which is a cross that the Egyptians used. I know those things. I want to show you something else, though. I want to show you something else. Torah. Everyone say Torah. Torah. If you go back to the really, really old Hebrew, where the first letter instead of Tav is called a Tau, and, uh, and it looks very much different. Do you know what it looks like? You can see it in the picture. It's a cross. And the second letter... And you know what the cross meant in Hebrew? It had a meaning all by itself, just that cross, which sometimes was slanted so it looks like an X, right? More often the X, but sometimes the cross, most often the X, which is very odd also because later on in a whole different language in the Greek, the X came to stand for the Messiah. And Christos stands for the Messiah in Greek. But in the original, the cross, and you know what the cross stood for? Covenant. It means covenant. Mark, sign, or covenant. Now let me give you the next word, the vav. And some of you know, if you haven't seen it, I want you to go online and find where I did, gave a message, the mystery of the vav. So you can understand that one much, much deeper. But the vav, the original shape, it's shaped like a nail. And there's a mystery in the word toldot. And some of you, I hope, remember it. You remember it? I, my own wife. So go look up the mystery of the Vav. You've got to know this. So the Vav looked like a nail. So we've got so far, we've got a covenant and a nail. And the word covenant is in the shape of a cross with a nail. And the third letter, the Rosh, Rosh is still means, right, it's very close to what? Rosh. And Rosh means what? Head. And the word Rosh, or the letter Rosh, was the, was, see it there? It's like a head. You see the hair on the top? It's like a profile. You see the profile? It was the shape. It's a head. And the head represented a man. Like you're counting people, you count. We still say today, count heads. At least we did in the military, right? Count heads, right? Count people is what we're saying. So there's a covenant, which is a, a cross with a nail and a man. And the last letter, hey, is a man calling. He's jubilant. It means behold, revealed. The Torah is a teaching. Torah means teaching or law, but it's teaching is the primary. The Torah is a teaching that's revealed by a man who is nailed to a cross. Do you think this is an accident, this one? So am, I, so am I altogether against crosses or something? No. <laughs> no. How can I be? It's part of old Hebrew. But 
Do I want to put a huge one right behind me that's going to scare Jewish people away so they can't come to their own Messiah? No. And I gave information to some of you. It's, you know, the stumbling block thing. What is the stumbling block? Is it seeing a big cross? Well, kind of today it is, but that's not what the original intent in the letter was. The stumbling block is the teaching of the cross, which means not the teaching of, of a, an object or something. It's the teaching of that execution that a Messiah came, but he didn't conquer the rule and rule and the world and rule forever from a throne in Jerusalem. Instead, he died. And if you ask Jewish people today, why, do you, why don't you believe Yeshua is the Messiah? A lot of them will say, well, he, he failed. He's, he's not ruling the world, is he? Because they don't understand there are passages where he's one, once, on one side, the suffering servant who will die for his people, and the other side, a, a triumphant king who will rule over the world. And they think that that's supposed to be two different guys, and it's really the same guy. They're finally coming to the realization and acceptance of the suffering Messiah a little bit better. The, the ancients did from before Yeshua's time. It's kind of been lost and it's coming back. The Lubavitchers, <laughs> all right, are saying, hey, we believe our rabbi is the Messiah. And then he died. And they're saying, uh, well, pride tells them they can't be wrong. So they must search the scriptures to find out why the Messiah died. And then they find out, oh, he's supposed to be a, searching, a suffering servant. He's supposed to die for his people. But he's supposed to come back. Baruch Hashem, that they have this revelation. They just have the wrong guy, right? Isn't it a good thing? We can see movements on the Jewish side. We can see movements on the Christian side where people are starting to, to there's these movements coming close back, coming back to what's true and what's real. There are all, let me get, let me, don't get me wrong. There are also a lot of movements out there who are going the opposite direction. But the book says, in the end, there will be a great falling away. It also talks about a revival in the end. That bride who makes herself ready. You need to decide, you need to tell people that they need to decide which one do they want to, which side they want to be on in this thing. Because it, when it, it's coming fast, people. It's coming fast. I don't say, I'm not a fear monger. It could, by fast, it could be years. Could be a couple decades. Could be a little longer. Even. Shaul thought it was coming. A lot of believers in the first century thought it was coming in their own time. It didn't. But we are seeing prophecies that have specifically been mentioned exactly to precision come to pass in our generation. They didn't see those things. When we see those things, we can't just, you shouldn't just push them to the side and ignore them. We need to acknowledge them. That's what a lot of the people in Revelation, the book of Revelation, when you read it, that they'll do. There will be plenty of signs from God. And the reason for the signs of God is to make people repent, to make them turn from their sin. But the, but the next line is always, but they refuse to turn. They were hard-hearted. Like Paro, don't be hard-hearted. And help others not to be hard-hearted before it's too late. Amen. And to see the glory, not the glory of the cross, but the glory of the guy who, who died on the cross on our behalf and made it possible for us to obtain eternal life and reconciliation with God. Amen? Amen. You can rise for the blessing.
times when I'm tempted to say things like, I hope I didn't step on your toes. And Let me say it different. I hope that your feelings aren't hurt by the truth. But if they are, I'm glad that I said it anyway. Because that's what I'm called to do is tell the truth. And if you hate me for it, Baruch Hashem. And if you love me for it, Baruch Hashem. Whatever happens, it's all for the glory of God. Adonai Vayishmarecha Yaer Adonai Panavelecha Vichunecha Yaer Adonai Panavelecha Vayasem Lecha Shalom. Adonai bless you. Adonai keep you. Keep you. Adonai make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. Adonai lift up his countenance on you and give you his shalom. Meshach Yeshua.